Okay, we're going to keep moving on to stay on, on time here. And our next speaker is a great friend of the Arboretum, like I mentioned, has done some fantastic work for us and is really passionate about trees and about their importance and how they can save the world. And I would really recommend getting signing up for Leaf and Limbs newsletter. They provide great, great information in their newsletter. It's a really fantastic resource to show up in your, your, your inbox. I, I always look forward to it and fantastic stuff. So we've got the Basil Camus, the, the chief tree ecologist, big thinker, a little of everything from Leaf and Limb here to talk to us about tips for uh, healthy trees. So turn it over to you, Basil. Fantastic. All righty. Um, let me first, uh, is there a way that I can share my screen here? There we go. It looks like I now have the ability to do it. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for joining today. Uh, really excited to be here. I love, I'm going to just make sure, hold on one second, before I get kicked off, let me just make sure I'm doing it right here. Can you all see my screen? Someone give me the thumbs up. Okay, perfect. There we go. All righty. Excellent. So my name is Basil. I am the uh, chief wizard of things or whatever you want to call me. I, I love trees and uh, I work here at Leaf and Limb. Uh, we are a tree care company. Um, before I talk about me or the company, I want to talk a little about the Arboretum. So I know a lot of you are probably, uh, this might be your first interaction with the Arboretum. And I would tell you that this is probably one of my favorite organizations in this area. There's so much amazing programming. You know, there are events when we don't have COVID. Uh, it's just a, an amazing community to be a part of, and you can learn so much. Um, memberships are really cheap. Uh, it's something like, you know, 50 to to $100. It's the price of going out to eat for one meal. So I, I definitely recommend becoming a member for your sake. It's fun. And then for the big picture, they do a lot of work with trees and with plants. You'd be surprised at how little funding plants get. You know, you've got like, the hard science is up here. And then like somewhere way down on the list is, is the arts, right? And the arts always complain about how little funding they get. But then all the way dead last is plants and trees and ecology. And I think, you know, probably in a hundred years, we'll look back and realize it'll be, hopefully we'll have made it that long, first of all. Second of all, we'll have a reverse order. I think plants will end up being probably one of the most heavily funded parts of science in the future because they're so important. And I would strongly encourage you to sign up, become a member, JC Ralston Arboretum, fantastic place. All right, a little bit about me. I love trees. It's, it's something that I, I care deeply about our planet. And for me, trees are a critical piece of the health of our planet. Uh, I'm not gonna get too deep into this today. I have a different presentation on this one called How Trees Can Save the World and What You Can Do to Help. Actually, the Arboretum has a lot of their past videos available. So if you want to go get that, you can. Um, Chris Glenn can put a link in the, the comments to show you all where those are housed. Uh, they got a bunch of cool presentations in there, by the way. Um, and then Leaf and Limb, we're a tree care company, a tree service. We're a bit non-traditional. Um, our whole purpose is that we care for trees. Um, that means we plant trees, we preserve the trees we've got, and we also spend a lot of our time promoting the importance of trees, which is why I'm actually here today. And with that, let's kick this off. I'm going to be chatting a little bit about uh, what are the top 12 tips for healthy, happy trees. Um, I hope to give you some really practical hands-on knowledge today. Uh, I'm going to show you some videos to keep this interactive. And I believe, speaking of videos, there is a way for me to optimize your video experience. Um, here we go. Optimize screen share for video clips. So we'll be, I'm going to try to keep it fun and interactive. Uh, and then I'm also going to do a little bit of tie into the because this is not just about how to care for your trees. Tree care is really so much more. 
my quick little spiel about this is that, you know, we've serious issues facing our planet right now. I'd list the top five most serious issues right now are decrease in biodiversity, the rise of air pollution, loss of drinking water, our, aqu our aquifers are running dry, loss of topsoil, um, and then oxidized carbon, you know, carbon in the atmosphere. These are major, major issues that are radically changing how the planet looks. And more importantly, they're threatening our food chains, our water supply. I mean, these are really, really big issues. And I would argue that trees are the, one of the most powerful tools for solving all of those issues. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on that. Again, that's a different presentation. But I just want you to know that when we're talking about tree care today, and we're talking about how to plant trees properly, there's a big picture here. And that is, we need as many trees as we can get right now. That means we've got to plant new trees and we've got to care for the trees we have. Um, so the tips I'm gonna give you today help you achieve that objective. Uh, and it's cool because if you think about it, if you own a piece of property, you basically have a little bit of ownership of planet Earth. You've got this little plot of land and you get to make a difference on the health of the planet on your little plot of land. And the more we do this, the more positive impact we can make for this planet. So consider yourself a land manager. And um, that means you need to be thinking about ecology and thinking about trees and these things. And this is the kind of stuff I want to give you today. Hey, Basil? Yeah. Basil, oh, can you um, see if you can collapse the, the um, pictures you have on the side of the screen? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. There we go. Is that, is that better? Hopefully that's better. Okay. All righty, cool. Well, let's kick it off. Number one. Um, so before you plant a tree, you want to make sure that species is suited to grow where it's being planted. So let me show you a photo I've got. Uh, this is downtown Raleigh. This is a, a city market. And check out this, uh, this oak tree planted right here in this teeny tiny little patch of soil. It's causing all kinds of infrastructure issues around it. I'm sure they're having to prune it off the building. In general, this tree is not happy. And you know, the people walking under it are probably pretty happy with the shade, but I'm guessing like the building owners and the people managing the concrete probably super happy. And this is because um, nobody thought about what they were planting in this given spot. So before you plant a tree, think about some really important things. You know, what's your goal with the tree? Uh, is there enough space for the canopy to grow up? Uh, is there enough space for the roots to grow? Um, and then what are the sunlight conditions? That's really important. I love this little app called Sunseeker. It's $10 on uh, the app store, but if you're a plant enthusiast like I am, uh, then it's, you mean, you'll use it all the time. It's worth 10 bucks. Um, and then also, you know, what are, like in terms of goals, are, are we thinking about uh, helping with ecology? So this is where we get into this conversation of native plants. And I'm gonna say this time and time again, especially when it comes to trees and all plants, really. I'm a very, very big proponent of native. It doesn't mean you can't have some fun exotic species mixed in. I don't think it has to be all or none, but just know you should introduce some substantial amount of native species into your plantings because um, they are critical to feeding bugs, feeding birds, all these things. For those of you who've read Doug Tallamy, you know he loves to talk about the role of an oak tree. He gives this example of how an oak tree will feed something like 400 different species of caterpillar. That's just amazing. You compare that to say a Japanese maple and everybody these maples, but Japanese maples only feed maybe one or two species of caterpillars in this area. That's a lot of lost opportunity because there are lots of things that eat the caterpillars and then eat the things that eat the caterpillars. So um, when you have say an oak versus a Japanese maple, you're really providing a lot for our ecology. Uh, I'll also mention here, NC State has one of the, when you're thinking about what plants to plant, NC State has probably one of the best uh, selection tools in the country. They just overhauled it within like the last year or so. Um, and I love it. I use it all the time. I highly recommend it. I think you'll end to plant selector, you'll find uh, that tool. All right, number two, uh, when you plant you don't want to bury the root collar of a tree. So rather than me telling you what the root collar is, let me kick it off with our first video. And y'all, these are just videos from past newsletters. So, uh, you know, Mark mentioned this. If you go to leaflimb.com, 
Uh, you can join our newsletter every single month. We do articles. Uh, and so you're just going to see here some of our old videos that we've done, little snippets. Right, so this is about uh, burying the root collar. The second mistake I see is burying the root collar. Let me tell you what a root collar is. It's a really important term. The root collar is the base of the trunk before it disappears to roots. So it is literally a flare. Some people call it the root flare, root collar. You can't bury that. There's two typical ways people bury that root collar. Either they plant too deep, so you need to make sure that that, that flare is at grade or just above grade. Uh, or some people will actually pile mulch on the base of the trunk. Don't do that. Both of those things will kill the tree over time. All right, let me show you one other example. This is such a big topic. It's worth seeing one other. Um, this is another term we use uh, when we put mulch on the trunk of the tree. So I mentioned in the video, there's two ways you typically bury it. One's during planting, one's during mulch installation. Uh, when it happens during mulch installation, we call this a mulch volcano. Let me show you a quick clip here. You've probably seen this in the suburban landscape. This is what we call a mulch volcano. It looks great, but it's actually very harmful to the tree. Different parts of the tree are designed to perform different functions. The roots, for example, they are underground, they stay moist, they absorb water. The trunk is designed to grow above ground where it's supposed to stay dry. But having this mulch piled around the base of the tree constantly means that the cells of the trunk stay oversaturated. This causes damage to the cells, which means they're not perform their duties, which means the overall health of the tree begins to decline. By the way, I should ask y'all, uh, how is the video quality on your side? Because if it's really poor, I can do this without video. Is somebody able just to hop on or maybe Mark or, or Bryce, let me know. How's the video quality looking? The, the video is pretty good. There, every once in a while we get a little little break up, but um, that's that's video or or you talking just just a second or so. So they're good. If it gets unbearable, let me know and I'll drop the video component. In addition, the mulch volcano provides an excellent place for new roots to grow. And they begin growing round and round the trunk of the tree. Over time, this leads to girdling. Girdling roots will quite literally strangle a tree. This may sound bad, but the story actually gets worse. As the health of the tree declines, it becomes more susceptible to attack from pests and disease. To give an analogy, it's much like the human immune system. As your immune system becomes weaker, you become more susceptible to the cold, to the flu, and to other sicknesses. But the good news is, this is a problem that we can fix. Well, the mulch volcano is gone and the trunk is clear of dirt and debris. There's no longer any opportunity for the roots to grow around the trunk. And we've got exactly what we want, which is we have a nice, well-developed root flare at the base of the trunk. The root flare is where the trunk spreads out before becoming roots that disappear underground. That's it. Alrighty, y'all, I probably see this more than anything else. Um, so when you're planting trees uh, or you're mulching your trees, just keep it off the trunk. Or, sorry, let me say that differently. When you plant your trees, make sure your flare is above grade. And when you mulch your trees, make sure you keep it off the trunk. Alrighty, number three. Uh, we're all on the top. This is all about planting. Uh, make sure you dig a hole that is wide. So this is important. Here's a photo of what this should look like. And the reason we want to do this is uh, because those new roots need to be able to push out and grow easily. Uh, I also recommend avoiding any sort of fertilizer or additives here. If you want to add something in, add in some leaf compost. That's probably uh, the best thing you can do. 10 to 20% by volume. Um, I also recommend given the clay we have here to sift your back soil, uh, your soil. So you can use a shovel and just break up the clumps. Or if you get really fancy, you can buy these like big blenders uh, and you can, yeah, anyway. Um, and just be careful when you're putting that soil back in the hole not to smash it down. Again, we want lots of pore space, 
so that all the new roots can grow out easily and quickly. And uh, the, the better they're able to do that, the more effectively your tree will establish and be a healthy tree. All right, I'm gonna bring it to the big picture a couple of times during this presentation because I don't wanna lose sight of why we do tree care and why we do planting. We're doing these things, hopefully, because we understand how important they are. And we're trying to help create healthy ecosystems and a healthy planet. So we need lots and lots of new trees. Um, over the last uh, number of years, we, we've lost about half our forest. So scientists estimate that we need to replant billions of new trees. So if we're gonna do that, we careful about the right trees in the right spots. We need to be thoughtful about which tree goes where and how it's planted and what its role is in the, in the ecosystem. These are just the things we have to give some consideration to. And it emphasize your yard, you put in some native trees and shrubs and flowers, it's going to become this oasis for wildlife. So you can make a difference with your property. All right, um, let's pop over here. Number four. All right, Arbor Wood chips, y'all, uh, these are one of my favorites. They are, they're a little different than the kind of stuff you buy at Lowe's. They look sort of like this. This picture here is of wood chips. Um, but there's a lot of advantages to these. So let me start off a video and then I'll add on to this. One big thing you've got to watch out for, especially with- oh, Sorry, let me back up. Sorry. Um, one of the top things I love about wood chips is, uh, in addition to the fact that they're free, you can get them from any tree service in this area. Uh, they'll deliver them for free, or you can go to chipdrop.com, like C-H-I-P-D-R-O-P.com. You can sign up, get free wood chips. Um, we're always looking to give wood chips away, otherwise we have to pay somebody to take them. So we'd love to give them away. And um, that's, that's great, but the best part is they don't become waterproof. If you've ever dealt with a triple shred mulch, which is very common, you've comes waterproof on the top, or maybe you haven't, which you'll learn a little bit about that here in just a minute. Wood chips, that doesn't happen. And that's really, really important because we don't want our mulch to repel water. Then it's actually working against the health of the tree. So let's dive into that right now. With a triple shred product is it becomes hydrophobic over time. And this means that on the top of the mulch it begins repelling water. If this happens, you're not getting water in your root system. The tree has to have water, and now mulch actually becomes an enemy of your tree. It's causing a net negative impact to your tree. So, what you've got to watch for if you if you see water running off the top of the mulch when you're watering, or if you notice that the top of the triple shred is looking crusty, go check. Turn it over poke your finger through, is it soft and loamy, can you turn the mulch over, or it has a hard crust developed on the top. If you've got a hard crust on the top, you've got to turn that mulch over. Um, the easiest way to do this is with a tool potato hoe. It has prongs that point down. Very easy way just to dig, pull, dig, pull. Very easy way to turn the mulch over. Uh, if you're using a triple shred mulch on one of your properties or in your community, rest assured, it becomes hydrophobic. You need to schedule um, that mulch to be turned over at least once or twice a year. All right, I want to show you a photo of how wood chips look. They look pretty great. So this is wood chips instead of, uh, sorry, triple shred mulch. I want to be specific here. You can see they look really great. Um, I always recommend, you know, per not bearing the root collar, keep those wood chips two to three inches away from the trunk, which we did here. And then in terms of depth, uh, you can go, you know, you can go pretty deep with wood chips actually, but four to six inches is, is what I would recommend. Um, and this right here is about how it should look. I take I take chips out as far as you're willing to go. Um, but you know, one great would one great place to take them would be at least to the edge of the uh, of the canopy. Cool. All right. And if you've got questions, just put them in the chat. Uh, if I have extra time here, I'll answer some questions. Um, and otherwise, we'll get to them at the very end of this uh, event. All right. Number five is water. Water is a tough one. Um, it's, it's a challenge because one of, the, one of the problems with water is that a tree that's been overwatered exhibits very similar symptoms to a tree that's been underwatered. Uh, I find that the only surefire way to know if your trees are being watered is just to do some basic checks. So let me show you my favorite trick for determining whether or not your tree is getting enough water. Especially if you're new to this, this is the first trick. As you get better with plants, 
you'll be able to look at them and just see whether they're dry or thirsty. Um, that takes a little time. Here's a trick to use if you're nervous. First trick, go and dig up a little bit of soil from underneath the canopy of your tree. If it's very dry and blows away in the wind, your tree needs some water. If it's very wet and goopy and muddy, it's oversaturated. Don't add any more water. What you're looking for is you're looking for soil that has some moisture and holds its form, but it's not dry enough to blow away and it's not wet enough in your fingers. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Uh, you know, if, if you're thinking, well, how much should I water? The answer is until uh, the you reach this point at which your soil is, you know, the right, the Goldilocks zone. But it's hard to really know what that means at first. So I'll give you my kind of rule of thumb for a tree. In summertime, for every caliper inch, so if a tree is, uh, every caliper inch um, of trunk diameter, give it at least 10 to 20 gallons a week. That's for summertime. For the other seasons, you probably don't need the water. Um, so example, two inch caliper tree that you just planted, between 20 and 40 gallons per week. Um, what that probably looks like is with an open-ended hose, you leave it on for five to 10 minutes under the root zone every other day, something like that. All righty, so soil is the foundation for healthy trees and shrubs. Um, sometimes I question whether or not we're a tree care company or a soil care company because really the foundation foundation for so much of what we do and anything to do with plants is soil. Um, you can get very complicated with soil. Uh, I want to make it really simple for you. So I'm going to give you a video that we made recently about soil that breaks it down in just some really easy concepts. Here in the forest, the soil has everything it needs. And because of that, it can take care of the trees. It feeds this oak here and this thing is super we're happy. Here's the kicker. Each year, this oak drops these leaves. This rotting stuff is soil food. And if we have this, we also have air and we have water. This is what keeps alive. I'm Basil, and today I'm here to talk about soil. It is alive, really alive. It's like you and me, it needs oxygen, it needs water, it needs food. If it has these things, it's gonna feed your trees, it's gonna take care of your trees, they're gonna be healthy, they're gonna be happy. If it doesn't have these things, then you get this. This is what used to be a really beautiful old oak tree and it is suffering right now. It's a sick tree. And let me show you why. Check this out. So I'm gonna use this screwdriver and I'm gonna to try to push it into the ground. I want you to see how much I struggled to get this thing in. We're talking, oh my goodness, maybe two inches, if I'm lucky. That's definitely not full of air. You can just see this stuff. There's no water. And let me see if there's anything in here that looks like rotting food for soil. Nah, it's just more of the same. It's dry, it's super hard. There's no rotting stuff in here. This is sick dirt, which means we have a sick tree. Here's the exciting news. We can resurrect this dead dirt and turn it back into healthy soil by replicating what we see in the forest every day. So here I recommend that we put down lots and lots of and then we let the leaves fall and rot every single year. That's gonna create this amazingness that's full of air and water and giving the soil that rotting stuff it needs to eat. That means we've got healthy, happy soil that can then feed the trees. Now we have healthy, happy trees. It's a win-win. And the best part is this. If we do this on a large scale, then we can restore the health of this planet that we call home. So I like to make soil really simple. I like to tell folks it's just about air, water, and rotting stuff. And if you have rotting stuff, then the air and the water will come. Um, one way you can tell if your soil is healthy or compacted is do exactly what I did. So you'll notice here at this junction, I have these tools, right? Um, 
The screwdriver, uh, we use that test all the time. It's a quick field test. You should be able to push a, a screwdriver down eight to 10 inches in healthy soil without a whole lot of effort. So take a screwdriver, go to your garden, push it down. Can you easily get it eight to 10 inches? Um, if, if yes, great, that's awesome. You've probably got healthy soil. If not, which is true for most of this area, you've probably got hard clay and uh, you can also check water. Again, we're using the test we've talked about. And then the you know, rotting stuff would be things like wood chips, leaves, mulches, these sorts of things. Um, if you don't have all that and you, so you find that you have clay and you can't push the screwdriver down, then the next thing is to start feeding the soil. And by feeding the soil, I mean giving it rotting stuff. So uh, put wood chips down, let the leaves fall every year and let them rot. If you wanna speed up the process, you could do rototilling. Just don't rototill in the root zone of your tree. Um, that could destroy the root system. So if, if there's a tree and you need to break up the soil, uh, then you can use an air tool. You saw me use that air tool earlier in the, uh, in the video where we were blowing away the mulch volcano. But if you wanna just do the easiest possible thing, throw out a thick bed of wood chips and add leaf compost every year. If you come back in a decade, you'll have the beginnings of healthy soil. All righty. Uh, number seven, we're still in this category of things to do, well, you know, water, rotting stuff. Talk about fertilizers for a second. So I would caution you on thinking twice before you use what I call traditional fertilizers. And a traditional fertilizer is one that is made up primarily of, of NPK, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It's most everything you would find in Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, when we're talking NPK, I just generally recommend stay away. There's a lot of reasons why most fertilizers cause short-term gain at the expense of long-term pain, and the long-term pain is much worse than the short-term gain. Let me show you a quick video, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Traditional fertilizers generate all sorts of problems. They can undermine the stability of your tree. They destroy the relationship between a tree and its beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. They pollute our streams, killing fish and other wildlife. There are some good fertilizer products available, uh, but they are the ones that are focusing on enhancing biology, not on chemical inputs. So you want to look for products that have little to no nitrogen, no phosphorus, beneficial microbes, so those are fungi, bacteria, and then organic matter. Typically, the organic matter is going to be kelp, manure, yucca plant, these sorts of things. Once again, the key is to focus on the biology, the living component within the soil. If that's right, if that's healthy, your tree will receive all the nutrients that it ever needs. So my, my philosophical flame framework is that the planet knows what it's doing. You know, it's been doing its thing for millennia, way before we figured out how to create nitrogen a hundred years ago. So my goal in for trees is I don't want to try to like recreate nature. I simply want to, I just want to pull systems because I know that they function best. So when we're talking soil, this is, this is where, where I think it really matters. I don't think um, nature needs us to add nitrogen and phosphorus and lime and all the other things. It's just, and I know people are this one, uh, and a lot of professionals disagree with me on this one, and that's okay. But for me, I look at the forest, I look at a ecosystem what is it doing and I want to help it do that in the urban environment because when we're in the urban environment uh, trees do need our help they're not in their natural environment so when it comes to fertilizers um, I, I'm not against them I would say pick the ones that have um, organic matter and stuff as their basis so get a product like a compost tea that's that's going to have microbes and fungi and and rotting maybe some yucca plants or some cow manure, like that's much better because then we're feeding the biology that lives in the soil already. Um, and when we're talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you saw I talked about a few of the negative things. Uh, I, don't, I can go in the rabbit hole here, negative impacts, but the short version is that uh, all three of them cause long-term issues for your plants. Cool. All right, that wraps up the soil section. Uh, bring it big picture here again. Uh, soil and trees form this yin-yang relationship. You can't have one without the other. 
And uh, the relationship is so interesting. There's so many books written about this. Like, uh, you know, just to pique your interest, scientists don't really know where a tree begins and where soil and vice versa. The relationships are too intertangled. So, trees, we've got to have healthy soil. We're on number eight of 12 here, and uh, we are 15 minutes left, so I think we're doing pretty good. Um, this is probably uh, one of the top three most important slides on this. Uh, when pruning, always have a goal in mind. It's so important. A lot of people question why we have to prune a tree, right? If we go back to the philosophical framework that I just mentioned, you know, trees don't need our intervention, right? Well, the problem is that in the urban environment, it's not a normal environment for trees. So they actually do need some help with pruning. Uh, let me show you what I think is the best, most important kind of pruning. We call it structural pruning in our industry. Here in the forest, trees compete for sunlight. And this means they grow tall, strong, and straight. But if left on their own, like this elm tree here, they often overgrow and themselves in the long the answer is structural pruning. Hi, I'm Basil, and today we're talking about why we prune. It's the competition here in this forest that forces these trees to grow tall. You'll notice they all have general structure. They have a central straight trunk and well-balanced branches. This is really important for a tree. It's this ideal structure that helps keep them healthy and prevent structure is strength. If we take away the forest, then all of a sudden this lone tree has all of the sunlight it could pop on. And that means it's going to grow every which away, and it loses that really important structure that we saw. So I'll show you a couple of examples here on this elm tree. First of all, you'll notice that it has two trunks. And between these two trunks, it has this seam. This is something that could very easily separate in a windstorm, especially as the tree gets older. Then if we look up in the canopy, we see all these large overextended branches. It lacks the structure that we saw in the forest. And unfortunately for this tree, that means that it could split. If it happens, it could cause damage to property, somebody, it would almost certainly be the end of this tree's life. The solution is structural pruning. And really that begins with a young tree like this oak. But it's for older trees as well. The idea is that we remove branches to create the structure we're looking for. The process takes many, many, because we can only remove so many branches at any given time. I'm gonna cut it short there. Um, when you're hiring a tree care company to do your pruning, and I would obviously recommend you hire Leaf and Limb, uh, this is something we do a lot of. But when you're hiring somebody to do pruning, or if you want to have a go at it yourself, um, the, the goal here is we want to build structure for the future. So that means a strong central trunk and smaller well-spaced branches. It gets really technical, but that's just sort of the big picture right there. Uh, if you would like to learn a little bit, um, two of my favorite books are, um, I love, uh, Ed Gilman writes a couple of books on pruning. He was a I believe at the University of Florida, but his books are really good. He's got two that you can buy on Amazon. I like them both. Um, and then uh, if you want to get in the shrub category, Cass Turnbull uh, has a pruning third edition. So those are three books that I recommend if you really want to geek out on pruning. There's a bunch of cool stuff. All right, uh, number next on pruning. So it's not just a goal, which structural pruning is, in my opinion, the most important goal. Uh, but it's also about where we make the cuts. This is like nuts and bolts. It's just a fundamental, I'm gonna play a video rather than get on my high horse here. I see it all the time. I walk past a tree, I see pruning cuts, and I scratch my head, I'm like, my God, this person just spent $600 to get this beautiful oak tree pruned, but in fact, they spent dollars to kill the tree. 
Hello, I'm Basil, I'm an ecologist with Leaf and Limb, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about pruning. This is the bare minimum, because pruning is a very complex topic. There are whole books on the topic, there are whole training units on these topics, but I want to hit one really important thing. When you cut a branch, it has to be made in precisely the right manner at precisely the right location. You cannot just cut a branch anywhere. There's only one place on a branch where it has the ability to heal. We're going to call it healing, even though a tree does something a little different, compartmentalizes. At the branch collar, which is a very distinct portion near the base of a branch or near where a lateral splits off of a branch, there are chemicals within the tree that allow it to properly compartmentalize this new wound. If you cut a branch anywhere else, it can't heal. It rots backwards into the trunk of the tree, and now you've got a tree that's rotting from the inside out. Yeah, this is one of those things where it's really unfortunate because um, you, know, you might find yourself comparing a bid on pruning, and you think, ah, this company is like a little more expensive, and, and you know, it's just pruning, right? Just cutting a branch. The problem is when it comes to cutting branches, it really is a very precise science that can only be cut in certain places. Otherwise you create hollows in your tree and it might take 10 or 20 years that tree's now got a hollow. And this is one of my biggest pet peeves about trees. I uh, don't have many, but this is one of them. I wish they would react faster so people could see, uh-oh, we made a mistake. It takes 10 or 20 years to see the mistakes. It's not like your grass where there's a mistake and you know, next week you see it. This is one of those that'll take time. All right, bring a big picture here. So pruning, we know structural pruning keeps trees strong and healthy. That means it keeps us safe and it keeps them living longer. That's really important. If we're gonna get millions of new trees planted, which we need to, then we've gotta make sure we're maintaining those trees in the urban environment in a way that keeps them safe and keeps them living long, happy lives. All right, y'all, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, we're gonna just quickly talk about pesticides and pests in general. Um, we want to avoid using what are called broad spectrum pesticides. You might be asking yourself, what is broad spectrum? Uh, that's where people use what I'll call the shotgun approach. Spray stuff on the plant, hoping you get the target pest, um, which you really need to be doing, and maybe you is not the right word. What people who treat for pests need to be doing is they need to be using the sniper approach. You need to be hitting your target exactly when it's most vulnerable. That creates the least amount of collateral damage to the ecosystem. I'll show you one, uh, two things here real quick. Number one, this is a bid from a company here in Raleigh. Um, if you see this on your, uh, this highlighted portion, if you ever see anything like this on your bids, please immediately say no. This treatment is a mixture of insecticide, miticide, and fungicide. That is not how things work with trees and insects. You can't just spray a blanket of stuff and get all your problems knocked out. It just doesn't work like that. Ecosystems are very complicated. Uh, I'll give you one quick example. Um, if you say, do a, a broad spectrum insecticide to get, I don't know, say, azalea lace bug, which is a common thing in this area, your pesticide will kill the lace bug, but it'll also kill everything else on the plant. So then what you'll notice happening in a couple of months is you'll have an explosion of two pests. You'll get mites because now there's no insects to eat the mites and the lace bugs will explode because they're predatory. The, the things that eat them are gone. So you end up creating this problem that's worse than with what you begin. And um, that's just scratching the surface. So uh, let's watch a quick video on this topic. This is, I believe our last video, yeah. When treating for pests, you've got to be very specific in how you do so. The goal is to disrupt the life cycle of that specific organism without causing any unintended harm to other members of the ecosystem. Otherwise, you might end with a problem much bigger than the one you started with. Another very effective way to treat pests is to identify the underlying health issue and fix that. Because if you can do that, you'll healthy tree that's able to naturally defend itself from these pests by keeping a balanced ecosystem. So y'all, we know that like in nature, you know, we're pre-human, uh, there was nobody out there with backpack sprayers on treating for gloomy scale. So therefore we know that a maple can uh, defend itself against pests. Gloomy scale is a very prevalent one here in this area. 
Um, and all trees can. They've got built-in defenses, really complex, amazing defenses for protecting themselves against pests. The, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel here, but then that begs the question, well, why do our plants and the landscape have issues with pests? Well, it's because there's underlying health issues. It's probably related to soil, but it might be related to water or it might be related to mulch being piled on the tree. Uh, these are what we call underlying health issues. If we can figure out underlying health issues, then we can give the, then the tree has its ability to defend itself and we don't have to spray anything, which is great. And just as a quick little side note, even about spraying, um, there are a lot of cool alternatives out there. So something that we do a lot of here at Leaf and Limb is we actually release predatory insects that eat our targets. Uh, rather than using chemicals at all, which we are uh, about one product away from being completely chemical free. But uh, this is a big, there, there are companies out there where you can buy bugs and you can release the bugs on your plants and then those bugs will hatch, go eat the bugs you're trying to get rid of and, and, and now you have a healthy plant and you didn't even have to spray anything. Cool, um, let's get to number 11. We are almost done here. Uh, this is also on bugs and pests in general. Uh, some pest damage is normal. We use a term called threshold in our industry. It just means that as long as the plant is not being uh, attacked to the point at which it's dying, then it's okay. Bugs, even pests, they've got to eat. So we should let them eat. Uh, now, if they're overwhelming the health of your plant, like for example, maybe there's lots of leaf damage or you've got big cracks in the bark of your tree or you've got major discoloration, now we've got to worry, you know, there might be an issue that we've got to deal with. But some pest damage is normal. Let the bugs eat. Speaking of bugs, uh, I want to go big picture here on this one. This is something that's, um, you know, we're, we're learning a lot more about insects. Uh, first of all, we know that trees have to have insects to survive. Ecosystems have to have insects to survive. And guess what? It's not just trees and ecosystems. We humans rely on bugs mightily. So for example, honeybees are a big part of our food supply chain. And right now uh, here in North Carolina, we've had a 45% decline in honeybee population over the last decade or so. And globally, this is a major phenomenon. We're seeing a lot of honeybees dying out because of the pesticides we're using, um, because of other issues as well. Uh, not only that, but just bugs in general. We know about honeybees because they're important to us. Uh, we don't know as much about our other insect populations. We'll learn more in the future, um, but we know generally speaking, we've lost about 60% of all insects worldwide. Um, and that means that our ecosystems are suffering, our food supply chain will suffer. Uh, don't forget, it is the, the, the bugs that transfer the, the, the sun's energy in a leaf to a protein-based diet. And we humans rely on a protein-based diet, so we definitely need bugs, and so do trees. Y'all, last one, uh, number 12, and I've kind of weaved this throughout. When you're in doubt, look at the forest. Look at nature. What is nature doing? Again, I you, uh, nature has been doing what it does for a very, very long time. Um, millennia, in fact. So we know that these systems work. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, all we really need to do is plant lots and lots of trees and care for the trees that we've got and do so responsibly in, in the ways that I've recommended and, and there are others. I think that each of us own a little plot of property. We have a little share in this earth corporation, let's call it. Um, and it's, it's up to you on how you treat your land. Will you use chemicals and will you put things in there that harm the ecosystem or will you plant trees and and encourage development of healthy soil and let things rot and plant native species and create an oasis for life, sequestering carbon and all the other things that trees do for us. Uh, you can learn more about all of this. Uh, we have on our website, there's a bunch of articles here. Uh, here's, here's one you might like, how trees can save earth and what we can do to help. But we have so many cool articles here. I'd love for you to come check these out. We have a newsletter like Mark mentions. Um, we have the YouTube channel, which we've been watching videos today from our YouTube channel. And then um, we also have uh, one other thing you might be interested in. It is um, on our website. Uh, you can become a trichologist. It just uh, got a, a couple of fun things here. There's a here 
Um, it's easy. It's just things, uh, articles to read and videos to watch. At the end, you get a free shirt if you'd like. And then we also have this ebook you can download and share with your friends, uh, Top 12 Tips for Healthy, Happy Trees. And I would encourage you to uh, learn more, spread the word, share this important message. Uh, this is our only planet. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's up to us on how we um, conserve our planet and care for our planet. And uh, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Basil. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, I want to add one thing. Early on, you talked about the, the soil on the tree collars and, you know, it can happen from planting too deep or piling mulch on. It can also happen in, in a tree that you buy, whether in a container or, or bald and burlapped. Often, you know, some soil gets knocked out of a container, they put more on there so it looks nice and it gets, it builds up too high. So whenever you buy a tree, um, scrape away some of that soil on top so you can see that root flare, that root collar there because um, don't, don't just assume because you got it from a nursery that it, it doesn't have that problem because um, we've found that often that that is the case. But that was fantastic. We're gonna have another, uh, what's that? That's okay. Uh, we're gonna have another five minute break, Chris. 10.50, we will be back with, with Bryce. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions while I'm hanging out. So if you stick around, is that okay, Mark, or should I not do that? No, that's fine. Um, I think Arlene's going to share, share oh, like just the background, but she's not going to be talking. So yeah, you can talk. You look in the chat and the Q and A, and a lot of questions were answered. But there may be um, there may be some that you want to expand on a little bit. So yeah, feel free to talk over this. Uh, okay, Hazel. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Got it. All right. Let me see if there's any. Um, okay. How do I think? All right. Let's see. Do you recommend breaking up the roots when planting trees? Uh, if they're wrapping around the outside of the container, then yeah, you do want to slice the outside. We don't want to have those roots wrapping right away. And Mark brought up a really good point. Uh, there are a lot of issues with trees coming out of the nurseries these days. You, so much work is required. The two most important things I would say is first, uh, clear out the root collar. Second, make sure there's no um, uh, roots wrapping around. If there are, tease them out or just slice them up with uh, my favorite gardening tool, the hori hori, a Japanese knife. Um, okay, other questions here. Okay, do, 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 do. Um, Fayetteville, yes, we work in Fayetteville. How far away from a tree trunk should your grass lawn be? As far as you'll send it. Uh, I am almost getting rid of all my grass in my yard. I'm very close, but at least the edge of the canopy would be ideal. Uh, for those of us living in the Raleigh area, can we just call Leaf and Limb to request? Yes, you can call us. We do have like 400 people on the list. So I would recommend calling a variety of places and chip drop for sure. Uh, uh, somebody asks about pests in wood chips. No, never a problem. Okay, I shouldn't say never a problem. We do have some invasive insects these days like the emerald ash borer. Currently not an issue, but that could become an issue. I will, I'll say generally not a problem with emerald ash borer being maybe one of the few that I'm starting to worry about. Basil, there was a question about insects like emerald ash borer and longhorn beetles uh, that came up while you were talking about using beneficials and not doing much spraying. Um, uh, that's a, and we have people that are that are on here from areas that do have uh, okay EAB. yeah so those are tough uh, right now okay luckily Japanese longhorn they're actually we're getting control of that one which is great uh, emerald ash borer is becoming a problem uh, here locally I know it's a major problem in other places currently the borers I said there's this one chemical that we haven't been able to get rid of yet it's borer prevention and treatments that is the hardest category but. Um, there's some very cool organizations doing research right now on using fungi as a way to get in those boring chambers and kill off, say, emerald ash borer. And also here in Raleigh, uh, City of Raleigh just got a grant to do uh, research 
on using a thrip, which is a type of wasp as a natural way to control emerald ash borer. So we'll have to see, uh, there's some promise there as well. But generally the beetle slash borer category is the most problematic and it's the one that nobody can crack yet on getting around the chemicals. Uh, my last thing on emerald ash borer, and then I'm gonna be quiet because it's 1049. Uh, there's really only one good treatment right now. It's a product called triage. Um, it has to be injected into a tree. It gives you a two-year residual uh, control. Um, that I would recommend. There's one other being sold right now. It's a drench, a soil drench or something called a low print. I don't like that one. It's not as effective and it has really nasty repercussions. So if you're looking for a company to treat your ash trees, look for trunk injections using a product called triage. It's very expensive. All right, it's 1050, so I'll be quiet now.